Breeder en lijkt ze zee. Met dat was achim in Jeruzalem, met simge en met vrij. En wissen we die wereld genoeg. Als hij ooit mijn leven Good evening. It's 28 years. Since the original Kimul Tammuz in this generation's Chabad calendar, world calendar. For that matter, it is 27 years, exactly a year later, when a contingency from the five towns walked to the Yoyal on Shabbos and met me in a mobile home in Old Montefiore. And the rest is history. Somehow, I was convinced, we were convinced, my wife and I, to come here and start Chabad 27 years ago. And It is truly an honor to be able to get together here to reflect on what Gimel Tammuz, the third of Tammuz, means to us. We have to thank our host. I want to thank the anonymous sponsors who graciously gave with their whole heart to make sure that this event can take place in full glory, as well as to thank the Schechter family for enabling us a temporary expansion of the Chabad Center. Baruch Hashem, miraculously, Chabad does have all of the surrounding properties and hopefully very soon move ahead with the next step and stage. For that matter, if you wish to dedicate it, let me know. No, no, not all at once. Anyway. Um, I want to thank for the centerpieces, Jerusalem Florist. Thank you so much for giving above and beyond all the time all the time. And for that matter, for this evening, I wanted to thank our MC, Nachi Gordon, who from the day Chabad opened was part of Chabad together with your family. And uh, we remember the good old days in the storefront. Rabbi Taub, our scholar in residence, who always shares on a regular basis his shiurim, his clarity, his thoughts, whether it's a Monday morning, monthly, or for that matter, soulwords.com, ongoing shiurim. As well as a dear friend, Rabbi Yossi Zakatinsky and family, and to mention, The Welt sagt, the saying goes, that Edom is a stick schwer. Loosely translated, that when you want to really know the true qualities of the son-in-law, and I'm not objective, I'm both. You look at the father-in-law, and it is the Schatzman family who are the pioneers of our Chabad Center. Thank you so much, and thank you for the expansion of the family that you brought along. Greatly appreciate it. It was 28 years ago that I had this chus, the great fortune and honor, to be the balkoida for the Rebbe, read the Torah, the last two portions that the Rebbe was physically with us, Pasha Shlach and Pasha Koirach. And for all of my colleagues, many friends, that void of Gimel Tammuz 
just becomes more real every day. At the same time, the expansion of the Rebbe's work, his legacy throughout the world is above and beyond. We see it today more than ever. When it comes to time of this nature, obviously we're going to be hearing that the Rebbe addresses in a letter that speaks about his father-in-law that way in connection with his father-in-law's anniversary of passing, and that is to reflect on the life and legacy and his, that which he instituted and to make sure that it continues. His unconditional avasistral, unconditional love for every single individual. For that matter, the idea is that he suggested that we learn on a daily basis and his kashrus, simply reflecting and connecting with the Rebbe. And in our case, we have the oil around the corner in addition to obviously learning from the Rebbe's teachings. I do want to thank our partners today. It was a joint project from uh, soulward.com, Meaningful Minute, Chabad of the Five Towns, Kahal Mavakshi Hashem, and the Thank You Hashem community. Thank you all for this great inspiration. And I really again want to thank the partners who together encouraged us to make this happen. Thank you very much. Without further ado, I'd like to call up our MC, Nachi Gordon. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I was very, very happy. I did not need to introduce the Rav because I still don't know how to pronounce the last name. So I really got spared there. Also, I think the only reason I'm involved tonight is to bring down the beard average. So why else is there an MC at Afa Bringen, right? This evening is all about commemorating the 28th yard site of the Rebbe. My namesake, many know me by Nachi, but really it's Menachem Mendel. A little bit of undercover, but here we can show our true colors. And it'll be an evening of nigunim, of divrei chizok, from words from Rabbi Taub, Rabbi Zakatinsky, some of the most talented, you know, uh, leaders that we have in Klal Yisrael today. But first, you know, I was thinking over Shabbos, uh, first when Rabbi Taub called me to be involved in an event like this, I saw Benny Friedman. And I was thinking, it's, it's so interesting because my great-grandfather, Rabbi Yechenon Gordon, is buried right next to the rabbi by the aisle, right before you go in. And next to him is his son, is Benny's grandfather, of Shalom Baragordon. So I felt something here tonight. Both of us being able to be involved in an event like this, commemorating the 28th yard site of the rabbi. I could definitely feel that both our, our grandfathers, my great-grandfather and Benny's grandfather, are here with us tonight, even though they have incredible real estate over there by the aisle. But... They're here tonight, and Mertz Hashem, this, this event, this gathering should be a schus for their neshamas, for the Shem of the Rebbe. And what can I say? We're, we're, we're here to honor one of the greatest leaders of our time, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So uh, let's kick it off with a niggin from Benny Friedman. I want to go ahead and sing a nigan called the Dokshitzer nigan that the Gordon family, the city where we came from in Rusland.
Oh, 
everybody sing it now. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be able to sit up here. I feel extremely humbled. And um, it's a privilege of mine to introduce Rabbi Taub, who will be speaking now, someone who, from my understanding, has been a big part of putting all this together I invited you. You invited me. That's true. That's why I'm here. <laughs> That's why I'm up here. I would tell myself got to know each other a little bit over a podcast we put out together. We really got deep. If you want to listen to it, then go listen to it. <laughs> meaningful people. Yes, I'm meaningful people. But uh, for now, we'll, we'll, we'll hear some words from Rabbi Shei Stav. And by the way, how to pronounce Reb Zalman's name. It's, it's Wallowick from Five Towns. It is. And I want to mention another thing. You want to know what the Rebbe's chassid is? There was a flyer for tonight. And the Rebbe Zalman, who is the Rav, the Maradasar of this shul, was not on the flyer. And this is the rabbi who gave probably the most famous speech any rabbi gave in the past 10 years. He was the one who said, yeah, yeah, it's okay. He spoke at the, the, the embassy in Jerusalem. He was at least that day the most famous rabbi in the entire world. And when it came to the flyer, I said, Zalman, you're not on the flyer. I said, it's okay. <laughs> Don't worry. The Rebbe's on the flyer. That's all that needs to be on the flyer. So that's Chassidish uh, Bittel there. Um, everything is Bashkoch HaPratis. Everything in Hashem's world is meticulously orchestrated, even when we don't know how. And it happened, happened, that our Gimel Tamas Fabrengen isn't taking place on Gimel Tamas. Gimel Tamas, the Rebbe's yard site, the third day of the Hebrew month of Tamas is Shabbos this year. But instead, we're doing the Fabrengen tonight. Is it Tuesday? Today's Tuesday, right? Monday. Monday. Monday? Uh, Monday. Uh, Monday. <laughs> but, the, but it is Chav Ches, right? Okay. Today is Chav Ches Sivan. Bashkoch HaPratis, our Gimel Thomas Fabrengen, is on Chav Ches Sivan. The 28th day of the Hebrew month of Sivan, which has a very special significance. This is the day in 1941 that the Rebbe and his wife, the Rebbe Tzanchaya Mushka, safely reached the shores of America. They were leaving war-torn Europe, They'd been living in France, and uh, they came here to New York. And the Rebbe began to work for his father-in-law, for the previous Rebbe, and began building the institutions and the organizations that became the, the groundwork for everything that the Rebbe accomplished here in America and all over the world. I'll tell you something interesting a lot of people don't know, even... Chabad insiders, the Rebbe came to America twice because in 1947, after the war, his mother, Rebbe Tzinchana, was living in Paris. She had actually been living in a DP camp in Germany, Poking Pines, Germany, and then she was in Paris. The Rebbe's father had already passed away. Unfortunately, he was exiled by the communists. He was targeted and uh, oppressed as a, as a leader, an anti-revolutionary leader. 
The Rebbe in Chana, the, Rebbe Tzin, the Rebbe's mother was living in Paris, and the Rebbe went in 1947 to get his mother to bring her back to America. And it's very funny, in those days, they could not tell you what date a ship would land. Because it depends on the wind, it depends on a lot of things. So it was, there was like a window of a few days that it could happen. And what date did the Rebbe, with his mother in 1947, arrive again in America? Chav Chasivin, the same date. Same date. So you got to figure there's something important about that date. And in fact, the Rebbe spoke about it in uh, Tavshin Nun Aleph in 1991, that Chav Chasivin is a Yem Zakai. It's a meritorious day. And we know it's meritorious because of the things that happen on that day. And the Rebbe explained what's the, the idea of Chof Ches Sivan. It's not just what the Rebbe and the Rebetzin were fleeing from. We all know they were escaping the Holocaust. They were escaping war-torn Europe. But even more than that, it's what they were marching toward. The destination specifically America. And the Rebbe explained the significance of coming to America. Sivan is called, in Torah, is called Chedesh Hashlishi, the third month. Nisan is the month the Jewish people left Mitzrayim, that's the first month. Iyer is the second month. Sivan is the third month. And the idea of three is the idea of melding opposites, or if you want to use philosophical terms, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. You have one idea, you have a counter idea, they seem to contradict each other, and then comes a third idea that's bigger than both, has room for both, and can harmonize them. In Sviras we call it chesed and gvura, which are opposite, and then tiferes, which is harmony, it comes and it brings the two together, the two extremes. So what is Sivan? Sivan is the month that represents two seemingly contradictory extremes. Is the ultimate truth, ain't aid malvade, that there's nothing but Hashem? Or, b'reish is bora likim, it's that Hashem created the heavens and the earth. So which is it? And if you ask a Jew a question, is it this or is it that, what's the answer? Yes. <laughs> of course, yes. The idea of Sivan is harmonizing those opposites. That they're both true, the spiritual and the material, the infinite and the finite, the soul and the body. And that's why Torah was given on Shavuos, the sixth day, according to the Chachamim, the sixth day of Sivan, because Sivan represents that harmonization of those opposites. Torah is the ultimate harmonizer of the opposites. It's spiritual tools for refining the physical world. The angels wanted to keep Torah in heaven. Gabor and Shabbos speaks about this. And Hashem said, no, Torah has to go down to the world to embodied souls so that they can do physical mitzvahs. That the ultimate spirituality is in physicality. They say the Vilna Gon, on his deathbed, his Talmidim were around him and he was crying. And they asked him why he's crying. Could he be afraid of judgment? I mean, he, he, he didn't waste a single second. He was learning Torah his entire life. Was, was he crying? He wanted to stay in the physical world? Why? For a piece of kugel? This is what the Vilna Gon wanted? What's he crying? That he's going to leave, leave this world? He's going to go to a Gan Eden? What, what, what should he be crying for? So he says to the Talmidim, he grasped his talus cotton, and he held on to it. He says, I'm about to leave a world, this physical plane, where for a few kopecks you can buy one of these, this wool garment, and you put it on your body, and you thereby fulfill the will of the Infinite One. And now I'm going to a world, to paradise, where for all the treasures of that world, you can't buy one mitzvah. So the whole point of Matan Torah, of the revelation at Sinai, is this, what we call Chibar Milo Matan, the harmonization of the spiritual and the physical. So the Rebbe explained like this. 
coming to America wasn't merely running away. It wasn't just fleeing the Holocaust. Coming to America was a strategic repositioning of the center of Judaism to the Chatzikader HaTachtoin. You know what that means? The lower hemisphere. See, we think of the globes that we use in school. The North Pole is on the top. The South Pole is on the It's so arbitrary. Why? Why do you put the North Pole on top? Everyone knows the top of the world. In fact, anywhere you go from any point on the globe, if you go there, it's called making Aliyah. What's the top of the world? Eretz Yisrael, Eretz HaKadosh, the Holy Land. So really, the top of the globe is Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. When the Torah was given, it was given at the top of the world, in the same hemisphere as the Holy Land, the Sinai Desert, very close to Israel. And then there's the bottom hemisphere, the, 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 the other side of the world, where Torah did not reach, at least in a revealed way. Jews, generally speaking, for centuries, for millennia, did not live in those places. Well, really, only in the past hundred years where there was this mass migration to the underside of the world. I wish I had my globe here on my desk. In my office, I have a globe. I specifically bought a globe that spins both ways, not just one way, but spins both ways. And I put Eretz Yisrael at the top so I can see how America, when you put Eretz Yisrael at the top, America is on the bottom. So the Rebbe explained like this. That coming to America was this, the ultimate expression of this marriage between spiritual and material, of high and low. And he explained it like this, that when you want to lift a building, it's actually a mushal from the Alter Rebbe, from the Balatanya, from the Sefer called Teira Or, there's a Maimer and Breshis, and there's a Yiddish word there that the Alter Rebbe uses, Lamed Yud Vav Vav Ayin Resh, lever, a lever, a lever, Chicago, we say a lever, I don't know how they say it in New York, but a, le a lever, a lever, <laughs> they say lever over here too? Yeah, okay, I don't know. I honestly, I had, to I had to remember how to pronounce. I used to say roof, and my kids thought, uh, like, what was it? You don't know what a roof is? You say roof. Now I taught myself to say roof. They thought you were barking at them. They, they thought I was barking, yeah. Or I would say, I, give me a can of pop. I, I switched. I switched it over to soda. Anyway, a lever, a lever. So the Alta Rebbe in Torah Ur says, why does the neshama, the pristine, holy, pure soul, why does it come down to such a low place? Not a low place, the lowest place, the physical plane. To be in a body beset with temptations and distractions and an alma de shikra, all the, the falsehood of this world. What is it, what is it needed for? So the Alta Rebbe says a marshal. He says you could lift the whole building if you use a lever. You got to get up underneath and then you can pry it up from the bottom. So when the soul comes down to the physical world by doing physical mitzvahs in the physical body, it lifts up all of the worlds, even the heavens, the spiritual worlds, get lifted up because if you lift from the bottom, then you lift everything. So the Rebbe said, similar to this idea, coming to America, America is the lower hemisphere. You come to America to do Judaism so that your Judaism lifts the entire world. And that was the Rebbe's style, the American style. What's the American style? It's a whole new style. I'll get into uh, the whole history maybe some other time. But uh, now he mentioned his illustrious uh, great-grandfather. You know, he was one of the people who were able to transition to the new Americans. He was, not, he was from Dokshitz. He was not from America, but he was able to do the American style. Not everybody, you know, that ever took a hairpin turn. Not everyone was able to hold on to the, for the ride. It was a radical new way of being. And one of the things with the American style is rugged individualism. You know, the cowboy riding into the sunset, doing his own thing. And the Rebbe sent shluchim. You know, it used to be, you want to be close to a Rebbe, stay right here, don't move. The Rebbe did the opposite, go away, go far. And the Rebbe took the American attitude of going out and conquering and being your own man and turned that into the ultimate bittel, the ultimate selflessness, the ultimate surrender. 
The Rebbe said, think for yourself. Figure it out. Think critically. I give a share in Igris Kodesh, the Rebbe's letters. I made a whole career in doing a poor imitation of the Rebbe's letters. <laughs> I wrote an advice column for eight years. I told everyone, it was an open secret. What am I doing? I'm just imitating the Rebbe's style in Igris Kodesh. The, the, the Rebbe's letters the Rebbe wrote to thousands of people throughout the years. And uh, what, one of the things I always make a point of when I'm, when I'm learning the Igris, the Rebbe's letters, is when you learn the Rebbe's letters, the Rebbe's writing to all types of different people, to a teacher, to a mother, to a businessman, and he's writing about uh, all types of issues. It could be about marriage, it could be about health, it could be about communal affairs. But one thing is, when you learn the Rebbe's Igris, you start to catch on to the Rebbe's style of thinking. And you start to learn, in, your, in yeshiva we call it a derech halimud. But in your regular colloquial way of talking, it's a way of thinking, it's a style. It's a style. And when we learn Igris, I always make a point to say, it's not necessarily what the Rebbe said. Because the Rebbe could have said one thing to one person and said another thing to another person. It's learning the Rebbe's style. Because ultimately, what was the Rebbe's style? Not to tell us what to think, but to teach us how to think. And that's the American style. To empower the individual. To place responsibility on you to figure it out. So Chatzik Kader Atachti in the lower hemisphere isn't just a geographical location. It's a whole style of Judaism. It's the Rebbe empowering each one of us, trusting each one of us that we're good and that we want good things. And that we don't, have to, we don't have to be forced and we don't have to be bossed around and we don't have to be told to nullify our personality in order to do good things. We could be told to the contrary, express your personality. Express your individualism. What are you afraid of? Critical thinking will only lead you to emis. Individualism will only lead you to a deeper relationship with the Rabbi Nishalayla. We're not afraid of those things. The American style is we embrace those things. I'll tell you a quick American story. There was a real American boy. He's now in Elam Amish. He's since passed on. I think he was 103 years old when he passed away. He's buried not far from here. Not at Old Montefiore, but at uh, Beth David in Elmont, which is about four or five miles from here. Just go up Mill Road, and you'll... Yeah, you know where it is, Beth David. So you know who's there? You were there yesterday. So you saw Herman Woke? No? no? Okay, Herman Woke, Pulitzer Prize, American author. He wrote the Kane Mutiny. He was in the American Navy. And then he wrote the Kane Mutiny based on that. And the Winds of War and War and Remembrance. One of the greatest American authors. And he was a frum boy. He was Orthodox. He, he was born in the Bronx and he was brought up modern Orthodox. And he was from his whole life. Chaim Zelig. Herman Woke's name was Chaim Zelig. So uh, Chaim Zelig, Herman Woke, he got introduced to the Rebbe through another American boy, through the head shliach from Minnesota. Where's Benny? So you should, I'm sure you, you, know, you heard from my Feller, I'm sure many times, Benny's from Minnesota. Benny's also a Midwesterner like myself. So I'm sure you heard from my Feller many times about the Rebbe's 70th birthday, and Herman Woke came with a letter from President Nixon. Yeah, okay. Rabin came. He was the, the ambassador to the UN. He brought the, the Israeli letter, and uh, Herman Woke came with the, the letter from Nixon. So uh, my Feller tells this story that Herman Woke has a yechidus, has a one-on-one -on -one audience with the Rebbe. And Herman Woke was from his whole life. He was Orthodox. And he was discussing with the Rebbe the prospects of what could a religious revival in America really look like? Well, what could we really expect? This was 40 years ago, 50 years ago. I mean, now you look. <laughs> you see what it looks like. But this was uh, in the old days. And Herman Woke was expressing some skepticism. 
saying, look, I'm an American boy. I'm from the Bronx. I know these people. I grew up with these people. Do you really think, Lubavitcher Rebbe, that you can get American Jews to start to do mitzvahs, good old, old-fashioned religion? And hear, hear, hear what the Rebbe said, which the Rebbe, being from Nikolayev, being from Russia, actually was, in this way, more American than Herman Woke. But this is like the ultimate American aphorism. And it's such a psychologically keen insight as well. The Rebbe said to Herman Woke about American Jewry, he says, I want to tell you about the American Jews. You can't tell them to do anything, but you can teach them to do everything. In fact, when Meshe Feller, when I heard him at a Fabrengen tell the story, <laughs> he made it even more American. He said, <laughs> he like translated it to make it, he said, you know, you can't, Sock it to him. That's how much of it. You can't sock it to him. You can't, you can't go around in author, authoritarian style and bark at people and tell them, this is what it says in the holy books. Now do it. Doesn't work. American Jews, doesn't work. But you know what works? Teach. Inspire. Empower. Trust. And this generation... And really, in this generation, really, we're all Americans. <laughs> we will rise to the occasion. And that was the Rebbe's style. And that was the significance to the Rebbe of coming down to America is to introduce a new era in Judaism that's not from above to below. It's not top-down authoritative. It's bottom-up. It's leverage. It's getting up underneath and lifting not only this entire world, but all the worlds, even the highest heavens. So, Chof Chesiv, and I'll say good Yom Tov. It's a Yom Tov. And uh, believe in yourself. Believe in your children. <laughs> believe in the person sitting next to you. Yeah, even the person sitting, yeah. Because, I'll tell you, the Rebbe's entire year plan hinged on his belief in each one of us. That's the American style. The Chaim, Chaim. Oh, yo, yo, 
I'm in a very hard position up. Shh. I'm in a very hard position up here because I know people who grew up in the five towns thought it would never ever be possible for something like that to happen. Yidin who went to Litvish yeshivas, learning Hasidus, having Fabrengen. So a little over a year ago, I was by the Sudas Mashiach in Kalmavak Shei Hashem, unassuming, just there with my brother to drag me along. And I was listening to Rabbi Zakatinsky do his thing, speak to words of, of, of Torah from the Baal Shem Tov, and I was completely blown away. And as, as I mentioned before, I have strong Chabad roots, but the roots are sort of where they stop see my face, you know, I don't look like uh, shliach, I don't talk like one, undercover, undercover, <laughs> not so much anymore, and after that Surah Mashiach, I looked at my brother, Yochanan, who at that point was already, you know, he's well along the path than I was, but myself and my other brothers, we looked at each other, we said, after hearing what we heard, it's time to connect back to our roots. So we decided we're putting on a kapata for Shabbos, each of us, all my brothers. And it's not just the outside, that it's not just a, it's not like a GQ story, like style, like, oh, wow, kapata. You know, that's not the, it's what happened inside of a shul on Lawrence Avenue. It's Rabbi Zakatinsky spreading the words of the Baal Shem Tov and understanding that Mashiach is waiting for all Jews around the world to hear that call, to hear that message. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the Rav, Rabbi Yossi Zagatinsky. Right. Don't believe anything he just said. All right, that's... I have just the Rav, Rabbi Wal, like, you know, you know how lucky you guys are? He's Mamash at Tzadik. Rabbi Walwick is Mamash at Tzadik. He's not from Tzadik. No, it's Mamash. He loves Yidin. He loves Yidin. You know, when, I said, when he asked me if, I, uh, if, I'm, if, I'm, uh, if it's okay for me to come and uh, participate a little bit and, and to be myself with uh, the Chavri here, 
So first of all, Tzadik Geyser, Tzadik Geyser, so I'm not going to say no to that. He also, like, he knows my shver, so I'm, uh, you know, I can't say no. I can't say no. I'm no one to give a bracha, but v'ani tefillah, v'ani tefillah, on behalf of all of us, that Hashem should give you continuous strength, continuous strength, kifli kiflaim strength, with all the hiskashas that you have to, to the Rebbe and all the tzaddikim, that you should be to continue to love you and be makar of you and lavim shba shamayim and be makar of me a little bit if you can, a little bit, maybe, maybe, we'll talk later, okay, okay. one night, there you go, there you go, something like that. I, so, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever found yourself in an uncomfortable position. I don't know. I find myself in an uncomfortable position right now. I, I don't wear a kapot on Shabbos. I'm the only, I'm the only litfuck on stage over here. So, yeah. what am I supposed to say? Well, undercover, yeah, maybe. There you go. Lamaisa, to talk about the Rebbe, is not, it's, it's, uh, it's nothing I can talk about. I didn't have a personal eskash with the Rebbe like the other people, like the other Rabbanim over here, the Chashav Yidin had. But I can tell you a story. I'll tell you Maisa. And maybe I'll try to give a little bit of an explanation to the story and we'll see where it takes us, yeah? So the Maisa is like this. It's a famous Maisa. One of the Chassidim of the Balatanya was Rishmul Munkis. So Rishmul Munkis was known that he did funny things. He was a, a big Ovid. So the Maisa goes that he was once by the Baltanya, by the Alter Rebbe, and the, the Baltanya gave a mimer, he was giving over a Torah, they were looking Chaim. <clears throat> and after the mimer was said, so Shmuel, he was such, he was in such Tvekis and such a spilas, that he quickly went over to the other Chassidim and he said, quickly, tie me to the tree in front of the Rebbe's house. Tie me up to the tree. Take a guard to tie me up to the tree. So they said, Shmuel, why in the world do you want to be tied to the tree? So he said, you know, when you pass by the shoemaker's house, there's a pair of shoes hanging up in front of his house to let everyone know that this is a house where they make shoes. You go to the carpenter's house, so you pass by, there's, some, there's a table and chair there. Everyone knows this is the place where you make tables and chairs, where you can get tables and chairs. By this place, by the Rebbe, by the Balatanya, he makes chassidim. So you have to hang a chassid up, that people should know that this is where, you, where, where a person becomes a chassid. So that's the question that I want to talk about just for a few minutes. What does it mean exactly to make a chassid? What does it mean to make a chassid? I understand what it means to teach Torah. I understand what it means that a Rebbe could give over ideas to a Talmud. You could present ideas before a Talmud and the Talmud listens and processes it in his own way of thinking. I understand. But what does it mean to make a chassid? Like you make a pair of shoes, that means there was no pair of shoes, and you with your own hands made a pair of shoes. There was no chair, you made a chair. What does it mean to make a chassid? But the truth is, let's go a little bit more into that. The very title, the very description that we have of chassid is an interesting one. <clears throat> so you know, there's two descriptions, there's a number of words, but two particular words in Chazal that we have describing a person that's a, a pretty good Jew. And that's a tzaddik and a chassid. A tzaddik and a chassid. What's the difference between a tzaddik and chassid? So Chazal tells us the word tzaddik is a description of someone that does shur sadin. What exactly, tzaddik, tzaddik, truth, righteousness, exact. A tzaddik means someone that does exactly what he's supposed to do. Not less, but not more. A tzaddik. What's a chassid? So chassid is someone that goes lefnim mishur then goes beyond the structure of Yiddishkeit, goes beyond what he has to do. He's lefnim mishur then. So the Sumer Akdashim asked the following question. So it's interesting, by the Talmud of Baal Shem, by all the chatserim from the Baal Shem Tev, it's well known that the Talmidim, the Amoinam, they're called chassidim, and the Rebbe is called what? The tzaddik. So that's a little bit strange. The term chassid versus tzaddik, chassid is a, is a better description. Chassid means lefnim ashur then He goes beyond the letter of the law. The tzaddik does exactly what he's told, but not more, not less. A chassid is a deeper, greater description. That's a greater person. David Melch says, shomer nafshiki chassid ani. He doesn't say shomer nafshiki tzaddik ani. So why in the world would all the, the great rebbes be called by the, all, all the chassidim? They call them the tzaddikim. But yet the talmidim are called the chassidim. Chartz v'nehapechu. One final question. What was wrong with the old term of Talmud, Bechlal? What was wrong with just Rebbe Talmud? Why did Baal Shem Tev and his uh, Talmudim and so on have to come up with new terminology, Bechlal? 
What's the chassid? So I don't know. That's it's really like like it's I see see them, but like so what's the chassid? So it's like this. A Rebbe Talmud relationship is one that's purely about information. It's about something that can be objectively seen and objectively quantified. The Rebbe knows uh, Masecha Shabbos. The Rebbe teaches Masecha Shabbos to the student. And now the student knows Masecha Shabbos. Masecha Shabbos is something that, even if you don't know the tractate Shabbos, you could talk about it. You could talk, you could say, I don't know the tractate Shabbos. You can say that. It's informational. But you know, when the Rabbanu Shalom gave the Torah in Har Sinai, he didn't just give us information. The first commandment the Rabbanu Shalom said to all of the Jewish people is, Anoichi Hashem Alekecha, Anoichi Evai Alekecha, I am Hashem your God. As Chazal say, the word Anoichi is an acronym for the following words, Anon Navshi Ksavis Yehovis, I am giving myself over to you. There are two sides to Yiddishkeit. There are two things that have to be transmitted from generation to generation. There's one thing that has to be transmitted from generation to generation, that's called information. And that's that transmission of content, of information, of words that can be qualified, classified, organized. And even if you don't know the words, you could, you could still see them on the shelf. That transmission is from Rebbe to Talmud. That's from Rebbe to Talmud. And in fact, we have a Bryce that's well known, Ketzer Seder Mishnah. There was a certain way of how even Moshe Rabbeinu gave over information. It was to Aaron and Aaron's sons, and Pinchas was there. There's a whole transmission of information. But then there's another type of Messiah, there's another type of transi- transmission. And the other transmission is not about information. Rather, the other type of transmission is something that Chazal Mesechas Chagiga described, which is called. The Mesira, the transmission of Saidis HaTayra, the secrets of Tyra. What does it mean, the secrets of Tyra? What does it mean, a secret? For someone that doesn't know the laws of Kiddush, so laws of Kiddush is a secret, no? So what, what qualifies something halachically as the secrets of Tyra? You know what the secrets of Tyra is? The secrets of Tyra is, is, is giving over the experience of being attached to the Infinite One. And every single Jew has a certain level of capability of experiencing that, of being able to absorb that experience of what? Of Anoich Evai Lekech, I am Hashem, your God. And as Rav Nachman Breslover taught, you know, Dovin Melch said in Tehillim, Dovin Melch said, Ki ani adati ki avai, I know Hashem is great. So Rav Nachman said, well, I know Hashem is great. Everyone knows Hashem is great. But Dovna is like, I know something that you don't know. I know God is great. Everyone knows God is great. Says Rav Nachman, no, no, no. Information we could all share. I can know things about God. I can know things about Judaism. You can know the same things about God and the same things about Judaism. Maybe I know a little bit more. Maybe you know a little bit more. And we could talk to each other about that. And I can say, I could talk about things that I don't know. I could at least point to it on the shelf. But what Dovna Melch is describing is the experience of Elikos, the object of Elikos. And that reality that Dovra Melech is experiencing, which is Havaya, which is that unity, that feeling of being lost in something much, much bigger than you, that's not anything that you can truly articulate. It's not anything that can really be explained to anyone else. It's something that just has to be given over. It's something that somehow in some way has to be transmitted from generation to generation. This inexplicable, inexplainable, unquantifiable experience of attachment to that which is infinite, that which is beyond, this is transmitted not from Rebbe to Talmud. This is transmitted from Rebbe to Chassid. When we when we talk about in Chazal, the term chassid means that someone goes lefnim mishur sadin. Let's understand that on a deeper level, the word din means that which is quantifiable. Din means judgment, structure. It fits in a certain box. That's information. Information fits in certain boxes. What does it mean someone that is connected to that which is called lefnim mishur sadin? That part of a Jew 
that's capable of what? Of experiencing that which is transcendent. The part of a Jew that's capable of experiencing something which cannot be quantified and qualified and explained and even articulated in clear words. It's just, I know the, the beauty of Yiddishkeit, I know the greatness of God, and that's not, it's an experience. That part of a Jew that's able to experience that, that's custom made to experience such a thing, that's called chasid. And the job of the tzaddikim, the job of the rebbe's, the Baal Shem Tov established, was not just to give over information, was to give over that experience of elikus. Now the elikus, the divinity that the, that the rebbe experiences, is completely unknowable to the Talmud. You see, in terms of information, even if the Rebbe knows more than the Talmud, the Talmud could at least point and say, the Rebbe knows those farm, I don't know them. So you could at least talk about that which you don't know. But that part of the Rebbe, which is the chassid part of the Rebbe, the student can't even articulate anything about it. You can't even say anything about that aspect of the Rebbe. Is that, that the level of, 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 of the Rebbe, the level of, of God, that the, that the, the Rebbe experiences, the Talmud isn't even able to talk, to say any words. Like the Zara Kodesh describes it as steaman, the kol steaman. Atikin, the kol atikin. It's, the, it's that which is hidden beyond all that which is hidden. You can't even say words. And somehow, in some way, the tzaddik has the obligation and the responsibility, the Rebbe has the obligation and the responsibility, not just to give over information, but somehow, and this is the trick, to somehow package within the information that he's able to give over and the words that he does articulate to the students before him, to somehow give over words that in those words is saturated the experience of Elikos. And then when the students are able to hear those words which can be articulated and can be qualified and can be quantified, somehow in a way that the, that the, the, the student himself doesn't even understand, something is changing within him and something is changing within her that somehow by absorbing within the mind and heart even the understandable words that the Rebbe says the inexplainable the almost in our, the, the, the chassid part of the tzaddik the chassid part of the Rebbe somehow finds its way in the bloodstream of the, of the Talmud and the Talmud sits by the shear of the Rebbe and at the end of the shear is able to then, if someone asks him, what did you hear? And the student can, can say what they heard. They can say all the different ideas, all the different insights. They could go through all of that. But something much, much deeper took place because encoded in those words of the Rebbe was not just the information. What was encoded in those words of the Rebbe was the transmission of that experience of Harsinai, which is called, Anoichi Havaya Lekech Ayim Hashem, your God. And that experience of Har Sinai, Moshe Rabbeinu received. And Moshe Rabbeinu gave that over to Yeshua ben Nun. And the way Moshe Rabbeinu gave it over to Yeshua ben Nun by giving a shear, by saying words, by giving over ideas. But the, the, the unbelievable power of Moshe Rabbeinu and those that follow in his footsteps are those that are able to somehow saturate those very measurable words with which that which is immeasurable. And then when the student hears those measurable words from the Rebbe, they become a chassid from that. Why is it that the chassidim don't call the Rebbe a chassid? The reason is, is because that term chassid, which is describing that part of the person that is experiencing elikus, the student, we can't even talk about what the Rebbe experiences in that way of chassid. All we can talk about when it comes to the Rebbe are the words that he says, the measurables, the tangibles. We call him a tzaddik. But the chiddush of the tzaddik is that he encodes in his words that experience of elokus that we wouldn't otherwise have a connection to. And so what we experience are the measurables, the tangibles, the tzaddik, the shuras hadin of who the Rebbe is. But then when we walk away from the Shir, when we walk away from the Torah, we don't just come away knowing more, we come away chassidim. And that's how a person becomes a chassid. 
It is impossible for a Jew on their own to receive Anoich Yashem Alekecha. That experience of Anoich Yashem Alekecha was given to Moshe Rabbeinu. And that experience has to be given over and transmitted from the Moshe Rabbeinu of that generation to the Moshe Rabbeinu of the next generation. And that's the only way it's transmitted. But the trick is that, though, that, that you can't really identify what you're transmitting. You can't really talk about it. Once you talk about it, once you articulate what it is, it's not the chassid. It's not the infinite. It's now finite. So the trick of the, of the Rebbe is that he's able to take something which is finite, the words of Torah. Like Rabbi Taub mentioned, the whole Chiddush of Torah, of something that is finite, but at the same time is saturated with that which is infinite. And the Rebbe is able to give that over, the tzaddik part of himself, he's able to give over to his students. And when the student receives the tzaddik of the Rebbe, then the student becomes a chassid. And that's what it means to be a chassid. When Mishmu Munki said that by the house of the Balatanya, this is where chassidim are made is because none of us, any one of us can, can go to a library, go to a base medrash, and you can open a safer, and you can learn information. And the person that's authored that book, or the lecture that you go to, and you come away knowing more, he didn't make you. He presented information, and you received, and you learned it sort of in, in your own way. The only thing that could be given over to you is being a chassid. It's the only thing that can be given over. And the way that's given over is never, it's never obvious. It can never be obvious. The infinite side of Elokos can never be, you can't talk about it. It's a secret by its very definition, it's a secret. Anything that you could articulate is already not that. But what the Rebbe can do is that he could package it in specific finite words. And this is what it means to learn chesidus, divrei Kim chaim. Why? Why is you know why is it? I mean, it? It's something that we find in many schools of, of, of from the Baal Shem, but in Chabad in particular, it's called divrei lekim chaim. You know what's amazing about? Again, I could. I'm a little bit of a funny thing, you know. What I'm saying, you know, it's like one of those things. If you're Jewish, you can say Jewish jokes, right? And if you're like African American, you can say African American jokes. So I, I I feel like I can say a lot of the jokes. I feel like I can make fun of Litvaks. I get the thing man chesidim. I, I feel like I could get away with it. So I'm not going to make fun of anyone, God forbid. But it's interesting, when it comes to Chabad Chassidus, the, 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 the Mamorim and the Sichas, from all, all the Nesim, going back from the Baal Tanya, Ad Hayyim, until the, the Rabbah. That's the, no, that's how you just get people's attention. <laughs> so the way, it's with such arichas, the length and breadth of the Mamorim, and the way... Every single Nasi try, is, is, is trying, is not just trying, is using very uh, tangible mishalim, parables, concepts to give over something which, after the mimer is over, you can say what you learned. But at the end of the day, what's amazing is the sachakal, every single mimer. Again, I'm not, gonna, I'm not an expert in any of it, but I'm willing to put money. That anyone that really learns chesidus knows that the end of every mimer, if someone really asks you, what are you taking away from this mimer? The answer really is three words. Einoid movadai. I, the mimer was 10,000 words, and it quoted 500 gemaras, and it was super complicated, went this way, went that way, and upside down and inside out. But that's not the sachakal, that's all the tzaddik. But the tzaddik is encoding in the words of the tzaddik, the measurable words, the immeasurable reality of Eina Melvadeh. And this is what you find by Shluchim. The, the kayach of, of these people. The kayach of these people. The mamish changed the whole world. They're not afraid of nothing. Mamish not afraid of anything. How are they not afraid? How are they not intimidated? How do they have such confidence? The answer is because they're chesidim. The Rebbe made them chesidim. And the experience of Moshe Rabbeinu, what Moshe Rabbeinu received in Har Sinav, that he gave over to Yeshua ben Nun. Moshe kibel tar misina umesara li Yeshua. Not the lambda, he didn't teach it. Ketza said to Mishnah, we have information about how Moshe Rabbeinu gave a shear. But when he gave over Elikus in that shear, he gave it over to Yeshua ben Nun. And Yeshua ben Nun to the Zakanim, And then the Zakanim to the Nevi'im. And the Nevi'im to Anshik Nesak Doyla. All the way down to the Tzadikim of every generation. And, 
and all the Hasidim of the Tzadikim are on that chain, are part of that Shalshal, is part of that Messiah. So what's our Avaidah? So I don't know, but speaking for myself, what do I think my Avaidah is? My Avaidah is like the Yushalmi says, you know, the Yushalmi says whenever a person sits and learns, every time you sit and learn, you should imagine that the person that you're quoting from, that you're learning from, is standing in front of your face teaching it to you. So you're learning a Rashi, Rashi's right there. Mamish. Abai and Rava. Ravina Ravashi. Rajva, Rambam. Balatanya, Arizal. The Rebbe. Mamish right there. Why? Why is that so important? So to, uh, to give a certain covet? It's not a covet issue. It's because if you want to be a chassid, then you have to receive from the tzaddik. If you want to be a chassid, you can't just learn information in an abstract way, just in a, in a little bubble by yourself. Happened to be, this information was written by an Adam Gadol. And that's not, you have to receive it from Aisha Rabbeinu. And you have to realize that the people that you're receiving Torah from, from your Rabbeim, to realize this, that they received it from their Rabbeim. And they received it from their Rabbeim. And they receive it from their Rabbeim to Moshe Rabbeinu himself. And when a person has that Moshe, when you have that consciousness and that realization that what you are learning is complicated and complex and amazing with super duper complicated details and it's all tzaddik, it's all din. But you should know what you take away from that through the hiskashras and through the dedication you have by simply wishing that you could see the people that you're learning from. Because that's also part of it. Like when I go to the oil, it's always like a bittersweet experience. I, I just speak for myself. So I go there, I watch the video. You know, like the, like the Midr Rebbe talks about in, in a number of places already, but one famous conscience where he talks about like what to do by Kivar Tzadikim, to be a yourself. And there's always like, you know, because I'm always reminded that he says over there, and it's really Mamish Givaldik, if you knew that Tzadik was, you ever met him in his life, and then you can imagine him, Mamish, being there, and he could be, he could be brought back to that place. I mean, it's, uh, but I think that itself, the fact that we wish we, we had the Tzadik alive in a physical way, in a physical sense, that we could Mamish go, get brachas and eitzes, and not even brachas, just to see his face in that way, that itself, that self is iskashras. That itself is, means that when we learn his Torah, we're receiving from the Moshe Rabbeinu that he received from. And that's our collective tefillah. Because when it comes to the Midas Hadin, when it comes to that structure of Yiddishkeit, the measurables, there's such a thing as Yeridis Hadaris. And the guys in the shul will know that my, the, the two words that I hate the most are Yeridis Hadaris. Those two words, I can't stand Yeridis Hadaris. What is Yeridis Hadaris? And the generations get weaker and weaker as the generations go on. As we move farther and farther from our Sinai, the tangibles of Yiddishkeit, the measurables, how much Torah you know, how long is your Shemun how dedicated you are, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. Because that's the nature of that which is finite. It becomes even more finite. But if a person is willing and able to be makasha themselves to what? To the im tangibles to the immeasurables, to the elikus that's somehow woven in those words of the tzaddik that you're learning from, then all of a sudden that which is infinite isn't guide, isn't governed by those rules of you as Adiris. Isn't governed by those rules. And just like Rabbi Taub said that when the Rebbe came to America, he was not in his spall. He was not in his spall by anything anyone said. Oh, it can't be done over here. It can't be done over here. If there's Yidin, what do you mean you can't? If there's Yidin, there are Talmidim, there are Chassidim. Their potential to see them. I mean, you can't. What does that even mean? That's coming from a person that received Torah from Aisha Rabbeinu. So when we are makasha ourselves to the tzaddikim emes, the tzaddikim of the generation, with gaguim, with hisrakshas, with espalos, we want to receive, we want to experience who God is. And if anyone here that's listening is thinking to themselves, I don't know what Zach Dins is talking about, I don't know, God, an infinite, good. Because you use that as a tool of, in, of, of awakening yourself up, of like, okay, I want to know. I don't know either what I'm talking about. But that, but that's, that, hagufa, that itself, 
I want to know what I'm talking about. And that itself causes the iskashras, causes the connection to those tzaddikim that have it in them, who the Rabbani Shalom is. Hashem should help us and Hashem should bless us that we should become chassidim. We should be able to be makash ourselves to the Rebbe and to the old tzaddiki emes and to find ourselves part of that Messiah. And when a person finds themselves in that Messiah of Moshe Kibbal Tar Messina, Messiah of Yeshua, then there's no Yerida Sadaris. It's the same Ilakus that came to our Sinai. It's the same Ilakus that finds itself in Tavshin, Pei Beis, and Lawrence. It's the same God. There's absolutely no difference at all. I'll end off with a quick story. It's one of my personal favorites. So maybe it'll become one of your favorites. I don't know. Well, my, it's a short mice. So the mice goes that there was a, a chassid that once came to Rav Nassim and Breslover, and he was asked for he asked for a bracha for shaduchim. So Rav Nassim gave him a bracha. Then he started talking to him about shaduchim, whatever, and he was giving him chizik. So by the breast by the, by by breslover, they don't just give brachas. They, it's chizik. So Rav Nassim said, you know, Yaakov Inu also had a hard time with shaduchim. So you're not alone. So, uh, Rav Yaakov Inu. Yaakov Inu's whole life was Sisri Tyra. His whole life is his retire. What have Shaykh is the Yaakov Avinu. So Rav Nassim said, you're making a very big mistake. Your life is as mysterious as Yaakov Avinu's life. The difference is he knew it and you don't. It's the only difference. It's the biggest bracha in the world that Hashem should bless us. We should know our lives are mysterious. Our lives are deep. And all the measurables of our lives, what's contained within it, that which is immeasurable, that which is infinite, that which is expansive, that which is transcendent. Hashem should bless with that akar, with that schaskas, with the schaskas of tzaddikim, and we shall be zaycha to become ayv de Hashem, chsidim, ayv de Yisrael, and should be zaycha to be able to see with our own two eyes the return, the return of the Beis Hamikdash, the return of Kli Yisrael, Teret Yisrael, Bias Kol Tzedek, Meher Vimenu Amen.
Just a quick disclaimer here. I love the rabbis up here. And I love Nachi up here. And I'd love to dance with everyone. But unfortunately, I'm in my year of mourning for my mother, so halacha limits me and I cannot dance. But we'll have to make up for it hopefully very soon.
We're going to continue with a few more words from our rabbis here. A big yashar koyach to Rabbi Tao for really putting this, together, putting this together with the involvement Chabad of Five Towns. None of this would be possible with, without his efforts. And I just would want to say that Rabbi Tao has been a tremendous gift to the Five Towns since he moved here, which is only five, six years ago. And the lives of the people living here have been enriched because of your presence. And at this point, we just asked Rabbi Taub for a few closing remarks. Um, everybody can, uh, everyone has patience. Story, right? Just a story. In fact, I told this story already, <laughs> right here. Achen Shel Pesach, if you were here at Chabad of the Five Towns for the Mashiach Sud, I told this story. But I was listening to Rabbi Zakatinsky talking about how Meish Rabbeinu is not just a teacher, but Meish Rabbeinu is a relationship. There are a lot of smart people in the world. And you know what? With artificial intelligence, smarts are becoming less and less rare. Today, if you need to know something, just go Google it. But what's precious and no artificial intelligence can ever replicate is human compassion. So there's Meish Rabbeinu as the teacher, the one who knows everything, teaches us everything we know. But then there's also Meish Rabbeinu, the lover of Jews, the one who doesn't just know information, but he knows us. He cares about us. And that's what I got from your, from your words. So I'm just, I'm just going to tell a story. The story involves a couple, an Israeli couple, a very secular, we're not Jewish, we're Israeli type Israeli couple, a Shomer HaTzeir Kibbutz couple. The family name was Hasofer. And they were so disconnected from Jewish life that they moved to Hobart, Tasmania. They were both academics. They were both professors. Michael and Atara, they were both doctors, PhDs. You know, you know what you get when one PhD marries another PhD? A paradox. Par Thank you. Paradox. Okay. So they moved to Hobart, Tasmania, the farthest place you can get from a Jewish community, precisely because they had no desire to be in a Jewish community. And wouldn't you know it, they show up, and the first day they're there, some strangers show up at their house and say, we heard that you're Israeli. We're from the Jewish Community Center. <laughs> they found them. And uh, they said to Michael, this extremely secular Israeli Jew, they said to him, we're from the Jewish Community Center of Hobart, Tasmania, and congratulations, you're our new rabbi. 
He said, I don't believe in anything. I'm not a rabbi. They said, but you have one thing that none of us have. You read Hebrew. <laughs> he said, it's true, I do. I'm Israeli, I read Hebrew. They said, good, you're hired. So he spoke with his wife about it. He said, you know, I don't believe, I don't believe in any of this stuff, but I want to be a good neighbor. And uh, if this is what they're asking us to do, they want me to come and read a few prayers in Hebrew. So I will, uh, I'll indulge. So Michael started to be the ad hoc rabbi of the Hobart Tasmania Jewish Community Center. And you know what happens <laughs> when you start, uh, <laughs> you think, you think you're just going to get involved casually. And then uh, one thing leads to another. And I can quit anytime I want. <laughs> Nebuch, they started falling for this Yiddishkeit thing. Now, at first, they rationalized it. They said it's, it's purely cultural. We don't believe in it. But we have children. They had children at that point. And we want our, ch our children aren't Israeli. They're growing up in Tasmania. Um, they won't have a Jewish identity if we don't observe some type of ritual. So they started Friday night to make Kiddush. And they had some semblance of Shabbat. But we don't believe in it. We don't believe in it. We just we want our, ch our children to have some type of Jewish identity. <laughs> but again, <laughs> you keep that up for, a lo for long. And they say, yeah, there's an expression. If... Uh, if you hang out in a barber shop long enough, you're going to get a haircut. <laughs> so <laughs> eventually they fell for it, and they became believers. The problem was, this was Hobart, Tasmania. You understand where Tasmania is? If you think <coughs> Australia is the other end of the world, Tasmania is an island off the coast of Australia. It's really the end of the world. And this was 50 years ago. There was no internet. Today, I've met Jews. I've met people who live in, a, I met a guy who lives in a trailer park in Nebraska. And every day does Rambam with Josh Gordon, Benny's uncle. Because today, Baruch Hashem, it's a connected world. But this is 50 years ago. If you lived in Hobart, Tasmania, that's it. You had no way to connect. There was nothing could go online. You couldn't research anything. You couldn't even get books. So one day, Atara says to Michael, I don't understand. I want to serve Hashem, but I don't know anything about his Torah. Now, I'm looking in the Torah. They had a chumash. That's what they had. And I see that any time that the Jews needed something, they would go to Moshe. Okay, so I see. This is the template. This is how it works. She says to her husband, she says she was standing in her kitchen in Hobart, Tasmania, and she starts weeping. And she says to him, I want to serve Hashem, and I don't know his Torah. I need Moshe to come and teach us. Where is Moshe? Efo Moshe. And she's weeping. She's crying. And the husband, Michal, he doesn't know how to, to comfort his wife. I don't know. I don't know. And he leaves the house. And he goes to the Jewish community center. Where he's the rabbi. And he sees someone standing in front of the building. A very strange looking figure. A Jewish man with a, a beard and a hat. Tzitz is hanging out. A real rabbi. And this rabbi comes over to Dr. Hasofer and introduces himself. My name is Rabbi Gutnik from Melbourne, Australia. Michael says, you're a rabbi? He says, yeah, I'm a rabbi. He says, I have someone who wants to meet you right now. And he grabs Rabbi Gutnik, this is Rabbi Chaim Gutnik, and he brings him back home, and he comes home, and he says to his wife, you wanted it, you got it. Here's a rabbi. 
And she had so many questions. She was so thirsty. She wanted to know ev literally everything. She knew nothing. And he stayed and he answered questions and questions and questions. And he kept up a correspondence with them. He went back to Melbourne, but he kept up a correspondence. After a while, the Hasofer family realized that really Hobart, Tasmania wasn't the place for them and their children. So they moved to, to Melbourne. Melbourne's an established Jewish community. And there are schools and shuls. So they moved to Melbourne. And they became a regular family in the religious community in Melbourne. To the extent they were so, their children were so uh, well adjusted there, no one even really knew they were the family that used to live in Tasmania. That's not how they were known. They were just known as a, a family in the neighborhood. So one day, one of the Hasofer children, a girl, by this point she was a teenager already, so this was some years after they had already moved to Melbourne. She's talking to her friend, Rabbi Gutnik's daughter, Pnina, and mentions, you know, before we moved to Melbourne, we used to live in Hobart, Tasmania. And Rabbi Gutnik's daughter says, you know, I know something about Hobart, Tasmania. I once had an experience with Hobart, Tasmania. I, I, I remember a bunch of years ago, my father, the rabbi, got a telegram. from Brooklyn, New York, from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, that said, you're doing a wonderful job with the Jewish community in Melbourne, but what about outlying areas like Hobart, Tasmania? My father did not need to be given any clearer instructions than that. He immediately went to the airport and he flew that day to Hobart, Tasmania. He didn't know who he's looking for. He didn't know where to go. He lands in Hobart and he starts asking, where are the Jews? Until finally somebody says, I think there's some type of a Jewish community center. And he marches down to the Jewish community center and he stood there and he waited. Until who did he meet? Michael Hasofer whose wife, Atara, was crying in her kitchen earlier that day, weeping. Efo Moshe. Hashem, send us Moshe to teach us. And in Brooklyn, New York, Moshe Rabbeinu sends his shliach, shliach shal adam kamei se mamish, like the Gemara says, that an emissary is oneself. Because some Jewish mother in Hobart, Tasmania is weeping in her kitchen because she feels isolated and lonely and lost and she's crying for guidance. What's the godless of Meisha Rabbeinu? Meisha Kibbutzera, Misinai. Lubavitcher Rebbe was a gone. Everyone knows that. Yechanan Gordon, my friend, told me, you'll have to confirm from him, that Rav Chaim Kanievsky Zatzal said, Ki yedua, that the Labavitcher Rebbe is the Bucky Hadoya. Right, Yechanan? Labavitcher Rebbe was a gone in Taira. It was Bucky in Taira. Kola Taira Kola. Bavli, Yashalmi. Nister, Nigle. But who is Meish Rabbeinu? Meish Rabbeinu is the one who sends his shliach that day because a Jewish mother is crying in her kitchen in Hobart, Tasmania. So this is way bigger than just Rav and Talmud, teacher and student. This is about someone who loves and understands and cares about you. 
I remember one time I was at a Sheva Brachas. I told you I'm telling you one more story, but now I see everyone's comfortable. And I need Benny to think of a nigun anyway, so. I was at a Sheva Brachas for a cousin of mine. Not a Lubavitcher cousin. It was in Manhattan, the Karlbach Shul in Manhattan. And uh, it was about 20 years ago. I remember I was in 770, and I took the subway from Crown Heights into Manhattan. And uh, I was sitting there, and there was a Jew, an older Jew, sitting next to me. And he says, you're a Lubavitcher. I was the only Lubavitcher there. So uh, he says, you're a Lubavitcher. I said, yeah. He said, I had Yechidus, and I had one-on-one -on -one audiences with, with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Well, if someone tells me that. I'm interested. I said, Tell me about it. So he said like this. He said, back in the 1950s, in the 60s, I used to go to Jamaica on business. So every time I would do a business trip in Jamaica, I would check out the Jewish community. It was a small community, less than a million. And uh, then when I would get back to New York, I would report to the Lubavitcher Rebbe about the Jewish community in Jamaica. So I, I asked him a dumb question. I said, you just told me, you know, like, <laughs> you're not a Lubavitcher, but, like, why would you report to the Lubavitcher Rebbe about what's going on in Jamaica? And he looks at me, totally deadpan, and he says, who else would care? And it hit me all of a sudden. That's a Rebbe. Reish Beis Yud, Rosh B'nei Yisro, that the head feels even what's going on in the pinky toe and is affected by what's going on in the pinky toe. There's a Rosh Hashiva, a teacher, a Chochem. That's one thing. It's a very important thing. And there's the Mesera Satayra. But then there's Meshe Rabbeinu, and like the Zayar says, Ispashtus de Meshe, the extension of Meshe in every generation, who doesn't just know a bunch of information, even holy information, but who knows you and cares about you. But I want to tell you something. I'm not even talking about the Lubavitcher Rebbe right now. That's not my point. I'm talking about you. Who will be the Zaydis if not we? You think that I'm telling you that the godless of the Lubavitcher Rebbe is not what he knew, but how much he cared about people? No, what I'm really trying to say, and I'll spell it out, is that what makes each one of us great is not how smart we are. Nobody needs another smart person. Smart people are a dime a dozen. Like I said, our artificial intelligence is coming to replace all the smart people. You know what will never be replaced? Human compassion. Human compassion is only more and more precious and rare. And I'll tell you something. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. That was a meaningful minute, right? <laughs> Naki Gordon. He always knows how to find this. By the way, you've been tracking mentally the sound bites here, right? How many sound bites am I, am I up to in this? Three or four. Okay. He knows how to take out the... Think about the people in your life. Let them know you care. Spend time. Bond with them. Find out what, what's going on in their life. Gimel Thomas is coming up. Don't just talk about the Rebbe and what made the Rebbe great. Be the Rebbe. The Rebbe's greatness was and is the love of every individual Jew. So don't just talk about the Rebbe. Be the Rebbe. Shliach shall Adam Kamei say, I'm sorry, I want to beg to differ with one thing the Rebbe Zakatinsky said. It was all beautiful, but one thing. He said the shluchim, which makes it sound like the official shluchim of the Rebbe. I want to expand it. I want to agree, yes, and, and I want to expand it. It's not just the shluchim. The Rebbe had this view of every single Jew of this generation, that you can be the one who cares. You can be the one who reaches out to somebody else. To the world, you may be one person. But to one person, you may be the world. 
there was, there was a, a forensic psychologist for the San Francisco Police Department, Jerome Motto. He did an interview in the New Yorker magazine. And he spoke about the fact that he used to do the forensic work when people would jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. Unfortunately, it was very common. And he would have to prove there's no foul play. How did he do that? He was a psychologist, but the person had already jumped. You can't interview them exactly at that point. He would have to retrace their steps and prove that they were, God forbid, in a frame of mind where they wanted to take their own life. So basically, that was his job. He used to go and look at people's history and their background to see what happened right before they jumped. So he said he got so used to this. He saw so many hundreds of jumpers that he became numb to it. He said there was one story that shook him and he could never shake it loose. He said one night they found a jumper and they went, they, they found ID. They went back to, the, to the, the, the apartment where the guy lived. They found an address. They walk into the house. They found a note on the dresser. He said, I've seen that a hundred times, a note on a dresser, nothing new. But then I read the note, and it completely shook me to my core. It said, I'm walking to the bridge now. If one person stops me on the way and says hello, I'm turning around and coming home. Do not underestimate the fact that you can be that person for somebody else. You don't have to be smart. You just have to be compassionate. And the Rebbe saw each and every single one of us as... I'll say something. I don't know if it's too bold. Maybe I'll take it back tomorrow. But people ask me, how come the Lubavitcher Rebbe didn't leave a successor? Lubavitcher Rebbe... The Rebetzin had no biological children. I mean, obviously they knew. I mean, plan, come on. Maybe it's not a polite question, but I've been asked the question many times. And I'm going to tell you my sincere answer. Lubavitch Rebbe most certainly left a successor. You. And when you learn the Rebbe's Torah, it's not just the godless of the Torah. It's that you're being deputized, tagged, you're it. It's on you. Shliach shal adam kamaisa. You are now the Rebbe's representative to know and to care and to love a Jew. And that means, I'll spell that out in really simple terms. First of all, charity starts at home. Know what's going on in your children's lives. Be the Rebbe in your home. That your child knows, like this guy knew, something's going on in Jamaica for the 10 Jews who live there. Who else would be interested other than the Rebbe? When your child has something interesting to share, they should come to you and not have to run to their friends. Because if they're not sharing their personal lives with you, who are they sharing it with? And what morals and values do those people have who your children feel bonded to? You just got to pray that maybe they're good people. So number one is, be the Rebbe in your home. Be the one that everyone in your home, your spouse, your children knows, cares. And then build on that. Bring your tefillin with you when you go to the grocery store. Bring your tefillin to work. You go to the mechanic and you're waiting for your car. You bring your tefillin with Women, bring tea lights in your purse. You cannot leave home without a Shabbos candle lighting guide and tea lights in your purse. Reach out to a Jew. And then when you get, in, you get, you, you get used to that, I'll give you expert level, expert mode. You could be Makata from people. Come learn Chassidus with me. Come to the aisle with me. Let me tell you about a Jew who loved every single Jew. And let me in inspire you to be more like that Jew and love every Jew that you meet.
the Rebbe left us marching orders. And that is to seek out in love every single Jew in your home, in your neighborhood, in your shul, at the gas station, at the grocery store, at a business deal, wherever it may be, online, social media, wherever it is, until we bring our entire family home.
Thank you so much for everyone for coming. That's all. <laughs> we out. <laughs> Have a great night. Thank you, rabbis, Zakatinsky and Taub. Thank you, Nachi. Thank you, great, really a unbelievable, beautiful audience. Thank you, Benny Friedman. I know you had a rough trip and you're jet lagged from Eretz Yisrael, and yet you made it. You found it in your schedule to be here. You made it possible. Thank you so much. I want to thank the auxiliary police and the police department and the mayor of our village for always encouraging community events. Yeah, a Fabringen does create light. That's the nature of a Fabringen. Not only Beruchnis, but Begashmis too. It goes together. Do I want to remind all who ate and drank to say a Baruch Achreina. And uh, we will have a minion Mairev inside. Not only uh, my concern about all of us having Mairev, but on a personal level, unfortunately, I have to say Kaddish. If you can help me with the minion inside, we'll be there. And looking forward to many more Fabrengans and the ultimate Fabreng that we're all waiting for with the coming of Mashiach. Shabbos Gimul Tamus. We'll have a Fabrengan here in about two o'clock. We'll take a walk to the Oil. Feel free to join us. We have a few Fabrengans along the way planned as we get to the Oil. Go before Shabbos, go after Shabbos. The oil is not only a place where we go to ask, but a place where we go to connect, to enhance, and to simply live the life that we should be living. Yeshakayach. <laughs>